Um, Zindel Siegel is the, um, uh, the uh, chair of the um, psychiatry department um, depression studies uh, uh, and is in Toronto, at the University of Toronto. And what's really interesting is that he has brought together this area of study called cognitive therapy with mindfulness. For many, many years, he was a researcher that looked at cognitive therapy, something that you all may be familiar with, um, and then came along and in the midst of these studies, this research, this very important, groundbreaking in many ways, insightful um, research that came about to understand better the nature of who we are and the way we grapple with life's challenging things, he came into uh, uh, an understanding of mindfulness. And in doing so, along with several of his colleagues, brought together what, if you know what mindfulness is, and you know what cognitive therapy is, might in some ways seem to be somewhat inconsistent. They don't necessarily, necessarily, obviously dovetail. And yet, through the deepest understandings that one can have of the work that we do, of mindfulness and of cognitive therapy, the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program emerged and has proven itself to be hugely important in society and in public health. He's the author of over 10 books, um, most recently, the Mindful Way Workbook, which is a wonderful avenue to both uh, learn more about mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and draw upon it in one's day-to-day -day life, as well as over 150 scientific articles. Um, I'm very delighted that we have the opportunity to get to learn from and listen to and share this thing called mindfulness. I want to lastly add that I had the uh, extraordinary opportunity about seven years ago to learn in a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy um, teacher training that was led by Zendel. And it was, for me, um, as a student of mindfulness and as a one who wants to share mindfulness, a very meaningful avenue for understanding what this thing called mindfulness is at an even deeper level and appreciating even more fully the wonderful ways and the creative ways and the very meaningful ways it can be shared with others. So I'm very grateful to you, Zendel, and please join me in welcoming Zendel C. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, to be able to speak about some of these ideas, to um, illuminate some of our thinking and to perhaps practice together, um, but also to learn about the productive node that exists here at the University of Miami in supporting and fostering a community interested in practicing mindfulness and expanding its reach into not just uh, fields of mental health, but in all kinds of vocational and other occupational and everyday practices. This is a very a generative place, I feel, and I'm happy to contribute in my small way to talk a bit about some of our work in depression. So the talk that I'm going to be focusing on is um, really the mindful way through depression, but it serves to try to bring together two constructs that may be sitting somewhat um, side by side without many obvious bridges for their integration. Depression as a mental health clinical disorder and mindfulness meditation, which up to a couple of years ago, or let's say a couple of um, decades ago, really had very few linkages outside of a sort of esoteric literature around uh, meditation and transcendence. I could have the next slide. Thanks. Just to provide a bit of background, um, what we're speaking about here is, is clinical depression. It's not the everyday blues, it's not ordinary sadness. Those experiences are, are universal and, and enriching in many ways. But when we're focusing on depression as a clinical disorder, there are a number of things that we need to keep in mind that will turn out to, to be um, eminently suitable for the kind of helpful practices that mindfulness can sometimes provide. So the first thing that we notice about depression is that it's very prevalent. Uh, some have called it the common cold of mental illness because estimates suggest that the general population prevalence is about 7%, but it's much higher in women than in men, uh, averaging around eight and a half compared to about 5%. And if you do the math, a prevalence rate of about 7% is one in 14 people if you look at women, the prevalence rate of eight or so percent means about um, one in 12 or so people. And that means that there are quite a few people who are dealing with a clinical disorder of depression. If you contrast that to the rates of acknowledgement, the rates of recognition in society, 
we know that very few people come forward who have depression for treatment. It's still seen as something which is somewhat stigmatizing and somewhat um, difficult to um, seek help for. I can have the next slide. The other thing that's somewhat surprising about depression and ironically perhaps even pushing it more into the limelight is that people are getting a better handle on costs associated with depression. Most of the perceptions of depression are of it being essentially an invisible disease. There are no physical stigmata, there are no obvious um, manifestations in the body of someone who is depressed, perhaps maybe a slower gait, perhaps a certain postural change, but essentially Depression costs society um, in the range of the fourth most expensive physical illness when considered costs related to hospitalization, out of hospital costs, ongoing medication treatment, and other resources. And this is um, a bit of an eye opener for many people because placing depression in the company of uh, coronary heart disease, osteoarthritis, stroke, diabetes, asthma, problems that have a real um, kind of nut and bolt fit to them, problems with breathing, problems with your heart, problems with your joints. These are the things that are, quote, legitimate medical illnesses. But expenditures for depression are actually well in that bar park. Next slide. And as a result, there have been a number of treatments that have been developed to address this issue. And this is an initiative that attends to the important public health significance of dealing with a problem that is so prevalent. It also attends to the problem of addressing a disorder for which there are very significant morbidity and mortality costs. Um, high rates of suicide, both completions and attempts associated with depression high costs of disruption in per parenting routines of women who have postpartum depression are able to, unable to bond with their children and are often unavailable um, for critical years of child rearing. And also increasingly um, a push by industry to recognize that people who are depressed often show up at work, often engage in very um, low rates of productivity and what's been called presenteeism people who are physically present, but really not working in any meaningful sense. And so these different um, forces are, are, I think, only now starting to push for initiatives that are more targeted to developing effective treatments. And the treatments have covered the gamut of different types of interventions. Um, I worked in the Department of Psychiatry for a long time, where most of the interventions involve pharmacological or um, neurally brain focused therapies and so the success of SSRI drugs and other medications for treating depression has been well documented. There are newer treatments that involve neurostimulation of various types. The first type of neurostimulation of course was uh, electroconvulsive therapy but there are now non-invasive procedures that involve using um, external magnetic coils to stimulate regions of the brain that have been found to be less active during depression and um, other forms of treatments that try to change brain structures that are thought to subsume depression. And as well, there have been targeted psychotherapies. This is not the standard lying on your couch and talking about the first thing that comes into your mind. These are psychotherapies that have been shown to hold their mettle against uh, antidepressants uh, in comparisons going head to head and showing equal efficacy. And these are treatments that try to understand depression in terms of some of the psychological skills and resources that um, patients need to engage with because depression has a very obvious way of shutting them down, activating people to be more involved, um, using ways of recognizing thinking styles that might be somewhat distorted or biased by a certain ability for negative mood to lead to negative conclusions very easily. And these are depression-specific psychotherapies that have done very well in helping to treat the actual episode of depression. One of the things that we've also discovered about depression is that, and it's interesting, if you read psychopathology textbooks from the 1950s and early 60s, what you'll see is that they recommend putting lots of resources into treating the episode of the depression. In other words, treat the person um, intensively while they're depressed, 
And if they are able to step out of their episode of depression, they'll do fairly well. And over the past 30 or so years, that view has changed now to recognize that there may be a couple of different subgroups here. One group of patients may actually do well if they're treated and step out of their depression. But there's another group that has a form of depression that is recurrent and potentially chronic. And what this means is that they may have an episode in their early 20s, they may get depressed again in their late 20s, they may get depressed again in their mid 30s, and continue on to have what's called a recurrent course to the disorder. And what this means is that depression is not seen as a one-off event, but as something that needs continued vigilance and continued agency to help look after oneself and to prevent relapse and recurrence. In fact, the treatment strategies that have been offered for depression recognize the need to continue to provide people with some sort of care, either pharmacological or psychotherapeutic, beyond the point at which symptoms of the illness have abated. And so if you think about um, taking antibiotics, often if you take an antibiotic for a, um, an inflammation or for some kind of sore um, or infection, the recommendation is to take them for 10 days. Now, your initial symptoms might lessen after two or three days but the advice is don't stop taking the antibiotic because the infection may still be raging underneath in some way that the rest of the 10-day course really helps to kind of uh, kill it off. And for antidepressant medication and even for psychotherapy, the, the suggestion now is that um, people should continue to stay on medication well after initial symptoms have abated or even ongoing psychotherapy or some type of routine of self-care is recommended. And this comes from the fact that increasingly, depression comes and goes in people's lives. This is Robin Williams who, um, since his untimely passing, has actually become a, um, a rallying point for people to um, describe efforts at depression awareness, especially given his public persona of being um, seen as a comic, seen as someone who was always up, always cheerful, and yet, having a very um, difficult medical and uh, psychiatric history at the end of it. And he talks here about the fact that, um, do I perform sometimes in a manic style? Yes. Am I manic all the time? No. Episodes come and go. People can have an episode of depression, then they can have a period of wellness. Do I get sad? Oh yeah. Does it hit me hard? Oh yeah. And so the challenge in depression is to deal with the fact that we have means for helping people get well, but we don't necessarily have the same level of um, sophistication and treatment intensity to guarantee that uh, people won't relapse, in other words, have another episode, or have a recurrence, which is the emergence of a new episode down the line. But guess what? This isn't a problem that's unique to depression. This is a problem that is faced by many types of chronic physical illnesses as well. And what's significant here is when you consider something like asthma, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, and other problems, the management of these difficult um, medical conditions beyond the point of an acute exacerbation of symptoms is to look to behavioral strategies that are ultimately effective in determining the risk of a new episode reoccurring. So for example, someone with asthma might use a puffer before playing football in order to reduce the risk of an asthmatic attack. Someone with diabetes might be very vigilant when they go to a restaurant to see what kind of foods they're ordering to control their blood sugar. Those kinds of behavioral enactments have been shown to be very effective in keeping new episodes at bay. Here's an example of a self-management strategy for diabetes. People are provided with information and asked to do different um, specific things for managing their diabetes. First of all, there's a little bit of education. And then there's a request for people to uh, choose specific foods 
that will help to regulate blood sugar. Um, actual monitoring of blood glucose is recommended. And then continuing to look after oneself on an ongoing basis. This isn't taking Prozac for a year and then coming off the medication. This is a lifelong commitment. And the payoff is that if it's not seen as alien to someone's own self-care, it becomes incorporated into a way of life. And that way of life has a much lower risk for incidence and onset of diabetes as well as the associated side effects, which can have a, um, um, a which can take a, a toll on the body over time of coming in and out of um, those kinds of episodes. Well, what if we wanted to do the same thing with depression? What if we understood that depression requires an ongoing vigilance on the part of the individual in addition to whatever effective treatments are available? And much like diabetes, we'd like to recommend to them that they could monitor this, keep track of that, do this for yourself, check in with yourself in this way. It seems sensible that these same behavioral management strategies would have the same payoff for reducing the rates of risk and depression. And there are some general recommendations that we can give people. Make sure that your sleep isn't dysregulated. Make sure that your energy at the end of the day is something that you're not feeling completely depleted and exhausted. But these are general things that can be recommended, not specifically for depression. And we'd like to be able to identify the risk factors that we think if you can watch this indicator, if you can look after yourself and make sure this stays within a narrow band, you'll significantly reduce your risk for relapse. And this is really the point at which the mindfulness story kind of takes off. It's a way of understanding how mindfulness can be a finely tuned antidote to the type of risk factors that people who have recovered from depression continue to face and how the practice of mindfulness might allow them to work at addressing these risk factors in ways that involve harnessing innate and plentiful mental and cognitive resources, such as attention and awareness. But how we got to that involves a little bit of um, research, and especially a study that I want to tell you about. This is a study that we conducted, uh, we published in 2006, and what we did was we took people who had recovered from depression and um, brought them into our lab, and we, we made them feel sad for about 10 minutes. We used what's called a mood induction. And we had them listen to some sad music. And the piece of music we used was Mo Russia Under the Mongolian Yoke, which is a section from a um, Prokofiev uh, opera. And we remastered it so that people were listening to it at half speed. So you have this very slow, kind of lugubrious music, and it's not really going anywhere. And you're listening to it over headphones. And then we also asked people to imagine uh, and revisit in their minds a time in their lives when they felt sad. So they're doing this autobiographical recall, they're listening to this music, and it induces a reliable state of about five or 10 minutes of sadness. And before we had them uh, get uh, temporarily sad, we had them fill out a questionnaire that asked them <clears throat> which of these kind of depressing um, conclusions about themselves did they endorse, things that they feel to be true about themselves from a, a sort of depressive perspective they're inferior, they're worthless, other people are better, um, they're weak, et cetera, et cetera. Then they were made to feel sad, and then we just had them fill out the questionnaire again. We wanted to see what the experience of sadness in people who were vulnerable, in other words, in people who had had a depression in the past, would that trigger a certain way of thinking about themselves? And what we did find was that the people who were made to feel temporarily sad some of them, there was really no change in their endorsement of these negative beliefs. Same amount before and after the sadness. But there was this one group that, as a result of feeling sad for five or 10 minutes, started to endorse a larger number of beliefs about themselves that had to do with feeling that they were not okay. Other people were better. They were weak. And when we followed those people for 18 months, that's the line at the bottom with the open uh, circles, we found that those people had a higher rate of depression returning into their lives compared to the other folks who were made to feel equally sad, but their thinking really didn't change based on the sadness that they were feeling. 
And this kind of work convinced us that what we were in, what we were trying to help people do who want to stay well is to help them work differently with their emotions, to help them work differently with sadness, so that when sadness comes into their lives as a potential trigger, their ability to follow a different track in their thinking can be enhanced instead of falling into the old habitual ways of looking and thinking about themselves. And so with that as a, um, a target for our treatment, we looked at mindfulness as helping to teach people how to have an experience of sadness and learn different ways of working with it. The point of our treatment wasn't to eliminate the experience of sadness from anyone's life. We didn't have a sort of Pollyanna-ish idea that uh, if people are taught how to be mindful that they're never going to feel sad. Sadness is really here to stay for all of us. But what is the experience that we can bring to it that will potentially prevent it from triggering old ways of looking at ourselves that may have been um, born during an episode of depression and suggest other possibilities? And so when we talk about mindfulness, and I'm going to show you, I think, in a little bit how practice of, the practice of mindfulness can connect with this ability to work um, differently with sadness and other features of our experience. But before we do that, I think it's important to, to define what mindfulness is. And when I talk to people about mindfulness, one of the things that I try to emphasize is that it's a, um, it's a loaded term for some people. It, it carries a certain amount of baggage. There may be spiritual connotations. There may be um, connotations that involve a certain religious practice. It may be something that is really conceptual and really hard to know what it is. I try to boil it down to the idea that mindfulness has a lot to do with paying attention. In fact, mindfulness is the kind of awareness that comes from our harnessing our attention and using it in a particular way. So when we pay attention, we do so in a way that brings our attention to a specific place, which is the present moment. And what we find in that specific place is something that we don't judge. We just observe it. And it's a skill, so it takes practice. It's not just something you can say to yourself, I just want to keep doing this, and your mind will do it. The mind has its own sort of agendas about what it wants to do, and mindfulness isn't always at the top of the list. But in thinking about mindfulness as attention, and in thinking about using our attention in this specific way, we come to realize that there are um, ways of becoming aware <coughs> of our experience that can be quite illuminating. And the reason that they're illuminating is that mindfulness contributes to an increase in our ability to choose. Not that it's a final destination, but that if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling happy, being mindful of what that experience is like for you can allow you to choose what you want to do next instead of having it um, pulled out of you in some ways by an automatic process of following what's gone on before, or what's been habitual for you, or what has been reflexive. Why is mindfulness so popular? Why am I here at the University of Miami giving this talk on mindfulness? It's because the training in mindfulness that was initially only offered in monasteries or in secluded um, locations that came as part of a, a different spiritual path is now freely available to us and it serves a broader agenda of self-care and well-being. These are things that um, are now being practiced in very broad spectrum ways through programs, through books, through uh, all kinds of offerings that allow people to engage in different activities in the course of training mindfulness. And there are different programs that have been recognized that provide the um, platform for increased training and resources in mindfulness, not just mindfulness, but in compassion, in uh, loving kindness, in breath work, uh, 
in centering and visualization, all kinds of things. This is sort of in our culture. And there are a couple of um, indirect ways of recognizing the penetration in our culture. One of them, of course, is when you appear on the, time, on the cover of Time magazine. You've finally arrived in our culture. The second metric, if you will, is being embraced by celebrities. So when Oprah and Deepak want to get on the mindfulness train, you know that something has arrived in our culture. They're offering a free 21-day uh, mind meditation training portal through an online platform. And the third one is that mindfulness um, is trending over and above the more traditional ways that have been used to treat depression. So these are um, a plot of search terms in Google over the past num number of years anyways. Um, and what you can see is that the trend line for psychotherapy is kind of going down. The trend line for antidepressant treatment is relatively flat and the trend line for search terms using the word mindfulness is increasing. And so in all these ways, mindfulness has come to us and uh, is available, but when it comes to understanding its role in depression, we need to drill down a little bit more and we have to understand, I think, um, either if we want to use it for ourselves, if we want to help other people through perhaps being therapists or recommending resources, what's the connection, what's the link? So I'd, I'd like us just to try something together for a couple of moments that um, may allow us to experience something related to mindfulness and to put some of what I've already been talking about maybe in a little bit of a better context. I also think that a fundamental principle when talking about mindfulness is that words only take you so far. And my, uh, my use of language can introduce something, but there is this other level of understanding that comes through experience. So if you're willing, um, maybe put both of your feet firmly on the floor if you've got something in your hands, maybe set it down on the floor. And you can, you can hear the room is already shifting and settling into doing something that might be a little bit different than just listening. And what I'd ask you to do if you feel like you can um, sit in a comfortable way, and if you feel like closing your eyes, that's also fine, or you can just keep them open and maybe find a spot in front of you to focus on is bring um, to mind your feet and think about your feet for a couple of moments. Just notice whatever thoughts come into your mind about your feet. You might have some thoughts about one foot being larger than the other. You might notice that your feet are perhaps tired from having walked around all day. Noticing any, any judgment or evaluation about whether you like your feet or there may be things about your feet that you'd like to change. There may be some future-oriented thinking about your feet, perhaps an appointment for a pedicure or a manicure in the near future and just letting whatever thoughts come into the mind about the feet, just be there noticing them, ideas, contrasts, comparisons, judgments. And then when you're ready, purposely breathing in for a count of three, and then when you get to the top of the in-breath, breathing out, letting the air leave the body for a count of three, and then bringing your attention from the breath back down to your feet, and this time seeing if you can simply tune into the sensations that you feel in your feet. Perhaps noticing the pressure of the feet pressing down through your shoes into the floor. Perhaps some sensations of moisture or tingling in the toes. Or feeling of cramping or 
contact with the outside of your shoe or sandal. You may notice throbbing or anything else that shows up as you focus simply on the sensations in your feet, the soles of your feet, the instep, the ankle, the toes, the big toe, the little toe. And then returning your attention to your breathing and breathing in, feeling the air coming into your body and then breathing out, letting the air leave your body and opening up your eyes and returning your attention to the room. And so this is a simple way of demonstrating that there are different ways of knowing our experience, in this case, our experience of our feet. So can I just ask anyone who might be willing to share, what did you notice as a p possible contrast between thinking about your feet and feeling your feet? Did anyone notice any contrast in that brief exercise? Yes. Uh-huh, thank you. So a direct experience, and this is one of the important insights in all of meditative contemplative practice, that we don't have to change our experience into something different. Our feet are still our feet, but we can bring a different mind to our experience that lets us see aspects of it that were previously perhaps um, hidden or unknown. If all we do is think about our feet, that's the only way we get to know about them. But there is this other way of knowing our feet, which involves knowing it through, as, as you've called it, direct experience, that involves moving into the sensations of our feet. And one isn't better than the other, but we can have access to both, and sometimes that can be very productive. And so much of what the connection between mindfulness and depression is, is that what happens when we do the same thing with sadness? What happens when we do the same thing with fear, with anger, with difficult emotions? When we explore the possibility of knowing them through a different mode of mind. And the important thing here is we're not pushing away anger or sadness, we're not trying to say, if you practice mindfulness, kiss your anger goodbye. That's not really what we're saying. But it might be that we get to know anger in a different way. And this takes training. Remember the definition. It's a skill. It needs practice. Every type of mindfulness or contemplative practice that we do invites us to do something fundamental with our experience. That is to attend and befriend. Attend and befriend. That's a phrase that Tara Brach, who is a, a well-known mindfulness teacher, uses. Attend and befriend are different than avoid and control, or push, a, push away and regulate. Push away and regulate are fine, and they can be important. But if you also add to your repertoire, attend and befriend, you have a whole different way of responding to these moments of emotional triggering. And those additional elements of your repertoire can be trained up by the practice of mindfulness. So for example, if you look at what people do if they go to a, a mindfulness retreat, meditation training of some type, you see that people work on um, experiences that are very basic, things like eating, sensations in the body, walking, stretching, breathing. And the instructions in many of the mindfulness meditative practices are, first of all, get to know your mind and your body. Just, just get to know them, just like we did here. Get to know your feet through thinking about them or feeling pressure, moisture, tingling, 
and then seeing patterns of experience. So as you start to get to know something about your um, feet, you may notice that there are thoughts that come up like, this is weird, why am I doing this? Um, and then those thoughts come up and you get to know them, you get to befriend them. And then you can start to make connections between the states of mind where you're noticing yourself being critical and judgmental and then other states of mind where you're able to stay with and explore an experience and you might notice new features about it. And it, then those experiences and those lessons will be equivalent in their application regardless of whether you're spending time and attention on your feet or spending time and attention on your anger. Yeah. And that really is what these um, programs that have been developed to help bring mindfulness meditation into the clinical sphere are all about. They, they definitely do not resemble um, your grandmother's group therapy. It's not people sitting around in a room and exchanging stories or talking about things. It's actually looks more like this, where people are sitting around and either not talking about anything for stretches of time, or they're engaged in mindful movement and other practices, following a curriculum that tries to introduce this type of training in a systematic way. And some of this uh, systematization has been codified through manuals and treatment resources that, that spell out very carefully where you start, how you deal with difficulties, and where you sort of want to get to in either working on this material on your own or with a therapist or an instructor. So for example, in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is our program, you can see that the, 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 the headings of each of the sessions, it's an eight session program, starts to help people move more and more into a contact with difficult experiences. We start off with just becoming aware of automatic pilot and how sometimes we're very distracted, living in our heads, gathering the scattered mind, but then eventually by session four and five, you're moving to pay attention to things that you don't really want to pay attention to, recognizing aversion, allowing and letting be, not having to change and control things. And then thoughts are not facts, and then taking care of oneself, folding it into a larger program of self-care. So think back to the slide that I showed earlier on how to manage diabetes, those are the same life lessons that we're providing people here when it comes to regulating moods and potential triggers that lead to depression. This happens in a couple of ways. It's not um, totally unscripted, but it happens through people practicing. And one of the features of this program is that people meet once for about two, two and a half hours a week for eight weeks but they are asked in between those meetings to practice on their own. And we give them CDs with audio recordings, we give them handouts that sort of describe and explain um, what they might be able to expect. And also, we start at a very gentle place. The first mindfulness practice we engage in is called the raisin exercise. It's a um, exercise of eating, much in the same way that we spend time slowing down and paying attention to the sensations in our feet. This is slowing down and paying attention to eating. And then we scan the body, which is also slowing down and paying attention to sensations. Then there's mindful walking, mindful stretching. By the middle of the program, we're starting to get in some t into some territory that's a little bit more difficult. Sitting with thoughts or sitting with difficult situations. But that's after about four to five weeks of specific training. And we also do it in a way that is invitational. We don't throw people into the deep end and say, um, bring up this difficult experience. There are ways of inviting people to approach what they might consider to be an edge of theirs, an emotion, um, a situation that is not resolved, something that requires closure, and then using the meditation as a context in which to observe what patterns or what reactions in the mind does this bring up. And there are different ways of also providing people with skills in grounding themselves so that they might be more willing to consider someone who may have said something insulting to them and, and what 
that brings up for them, if they're also able to ground themselves with their breathing or ground themselves through some movement practice and then consider that rather than just bringing it up and hoping for some kind of resolution. So you can see that these practices move from a place of inviting people to either stay at a safety zone if they prefer, or they can start to move more to a place where there may be some discomfort and stay on an edge. And different practices encourage that. So to try to link the initial thoughts that I had about what is it that we want to help to train people to do? We're trying to help them stay grounded during emotionally turbulent times. And the grounding comes from the two aspects of mindfulness that are provided through continuous practice. The first is that when one practices mindfulness, one engages in inducing a state of settled attention and concentration so that you can stay with your body and you can follow your breath. The other part of it is that once that is in place, it becomes a platform for introducing difficulties and allowing you to work with them differently in ways that may not be as triggering as in the past. So these programs, um, they tell a good story. People are interested in mindfulness. Um, there's a way in which people are also interested in looking at non-pharmacological alternatives for treating depression. And our research on what puts people at risk also suggests that there is a plausibility to the way these items and elements come together. But ultimately, the proof is in the pudding, and the pudding is um, in the form of randomized controls clinical trials. So to date, there have been about seven trials worldwide with over a thousand patients showing a robust effect size of about 0.46, I believe, in terms of showing that people who are um, taking these programs reduce their risk for relapse by about 46% compared to people who are in a variety of other programs or not in a program but um, are waiting for treatment. This is just one slide that shows some of the earliest studies from 2000 and the more recent studies. You'll see that there is an advantage in terms of rates of relapse for MBCT, which is the green, um, the green box, compared to the other control groups. And then most, more recently, um, we did a study where we compared people who were provided with an antidepressant medication to prevent relapse compared to coming off an antidepressant and getting uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And what you see here is that the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and MADM, which is antidepressant, both of those groups do equally well in preventing relapse. The group that does really poorly is a group that starts on an antidepressant, gets well, and then has that removed, and we give them a placebo. So in a sense, we take away their protection. So the protection afforded by an antidepressant and or MBCT are basically on par. And that's very good news because for many people, staying on an antidepressant for um, a number of years is, is not really feasible, either because of side effects or at times the antidepressants can wear out their efficacy and other um, alternatives are needed. And I think some of this data, and there was another study recently completed in the UK with a much larger group of patients came to the same conclusion, that the efficacy of antidepressants and um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is essentially on par. The other thing that seems to happen is that um, there are reinforcing qualities that come from the practice of mindfulness that allows people to continue to do this for themselves. This was a study that was conducted in the Netherlands where they had people um, listen, uh, they were given a, um, a watch that went off at random intervals during the week. And when that watch went off, they were asked to just write down on a piece of paper, uh, what was your mood like? What are you doing? Do you find it pleasant? Is it reinforcing? And a couple of other questions. So they were kind of getting a right in the moment assessment of what was going through people's minds. It's always interesting to listen in on people's voicemail messages. 
Um, and what they found was that compared to a control group, people in the MBCT group reported greater experiences of um, pleasantness and reward in their everyday lives. The very kinds of things that we would think would be encouraging of compliance, of staying with the program, of doing these practices as a way of health and self-care. And I think this is an important piece of the puzzle because we're asking people to continue to do this well after the program ends. So there needs to be some incentives. And then the other piece of information that's important is that um, there seems to be some growing body of evidence that how much you practice after the course is over does make a difference in preventing relapse. This is a, a recently completed study that showed that people who practiced three or less times a week had a higher rate of relapse than people who practiced three or more times a week. And, and all of this fits with the idea that mindfulness isn't something that we arrive at once we have an idea about it, but mindfulness is something that we build up a skill, like, like working on your forehand or working on your backhand in tennis. You need thousands and thousands of repetitions before something like that becomes automatic, accessible, and available to you in situations where you really need it. And one of the ways of understanding what gets trained is to look at some of the interesting neural evidence. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about this evidence because I think it supports and it helps to explain what kind of capacities people have for working with their negative emotions. So the first thing that's um, worth mentioning is that there is a part of the brain called the insula, and, and this is a simplification for all the neuroscientists in the audience. I just want to put that out there in advance, <laughs> especially Amishi. Um, so, so there is this region of the brain called the insula, which seems to be preferentially activated when people uh, pay attention to their breathing. And it's, it's also related to mindfulness. So if you look at the, the two bars on the left, extreme left-hand side of the um, graph, what you'll see is that um, the higher red bar shows that there's a greater degree of activation of the insula in the MT group, which is the people that have had mindfulness training, compared to a control group, which is people who have not had mindfulness training, but both of them are paying attention to their breathing. And when you ask people to suppress their breathing or just maintain an attention to their breathing, there's no difference between the red and the blue groups. Now, the insula is important because it's recently been identified as something, um, a neural structure that is an important part of what's been called the present moment network. And our brains are specialized for all kinds of different functions, but there is this network that seems to be well suited to integrate information from what is happening to us right now. And often that is information about the body. When we have a sensation, we can only have it in the present moment. And so the more we're able to attend to our sensations, the more our focus and our um, experience is about what's happening to us right now. And so the present moment pathway seems to be trained up by mindfulness in addition to a bunch of other things that are happening in the brain. But this is an important story because it, it does bear on the regulation of emotion. So if you remember that famous study where we made people feel sad by listening to music, we've done that again except this time in an fMRI machine. And so this time we had them watch film clips of movies that were sad, uh, Terms of Endearment and The Champ, where there are some scenes of, of loss, and movie clips from, uh, I think, the Home and Gardening show, where there's an episode on basket weaving and uh, arranging a rock garden. <laughs> Apologies to avid gardeners in the audience. Um, and so we had people who were sad and they were scanned, and then the same people were feeling neutral and they were scanned. And what we found was when people were sad, the insula, the present moment pathway, was less active. It was tuned down. And what was more active was part of the brain that's called part of the executive network, which is a way of figuring out what am I going to be doing about this sadness that's here? Do I, do I need to solve this? Do I need to get rid of it? Is it relevant for me? How can I manage it? So a lot of, lot of thinking. Almost in a way, the executive network is like thinking about your feet. 
the insula present moment network is what we did with feeling our feet. So when you make people sad, generally what happens is a lot more thinking about, a lot less feeling in the present moment. But when you look at what happens when people have been trained in mindfulness, what happens is that there is a rebalancing. And so people that have been trained in mindfulness are now able to do a little bit of both. They're thinking about sadness, but the insula present moment pathway is restored, and so they're also feeling the emotion in a way that brings in information from the body. So now they have two channels, in a way, to understand what does it mean to feel sad. They've got the ideas about it, but they may also have a sense of what it feels like in their bodies. And so now they can draw from a larger palette of experiences and then choose what they want to do next. They're not bound by the same habits or um, routinized responses to sadness. They've got something else that can inform their choice. And we think that this is actually quite vital because it helps people to choose from a place of greater information around what to do with emotions rather than to be driven primarily by old habits and old routines. And the last thing I want to talk about is how some of this work expands from inside the brain outside into the community at large. This is a study that was just published and um, it looks at the effects of mindfulness on our relationships with others, regulating our emotions when other people are present. And this is another one of those experiments where um, there's a little bit of deception involved. I, I don't want to give my discipline a bad name, but some of these studies do involve small amounts of deception and, um, and then there's an ethical debrief that lets people know what they were involved with. But here, you had someone who came um, to a room and there were three chairs. Two chairs were occupied by uh, people who were working for the experimenter in their lab, confederates, and there was one chair that was open. And the person who was participating in the experiment kind of came into the waiting room, saw that there was a chair that was open, and um, you know, sat down in the chair. The people in the experiment were previously exposed to one of two different conditions. One group, um, practiced mindfulness through an online program called Headspace. And another group practiced the same kind of attentional training through an online program called Lumosity. And I don't know whether some of you have seen Lumosity, but at one point they were doing some seriously heavy advertising on Google. So if you ever went to do a Google search, you'd see you know, little banner ads for Lumosity. So Lumosity is about training attention, but it's got nothing to do with mindfulness. It's about helping you um, recognize objects in the periphery of your vision or memorize certain placements of things or it's attention training in the same way that mindfulness involves attention but it's not mindfulness. So it's a wonderful control group because people are doing the same thing, they're spending time in front of a screen, they're learning and building up attentional neural networks, but it's not mindfulness. So these two groups of people came in and what happened was when the uh, participants sat down in one of the chairs Another person came in, who was also a confederate from the lab, hobbling on crutches, in pain. And the question is, how many people gave up their seat to the person on crutches? And what you see here is the number of people that helped was about 10 people in the mindfulness group and only about four people in the lumosity group. The number of people that didn't help were about uh, 16 people in the mindfulness group and about 25 people in the, uh, sorry, 16 in the, heads, in the mindfulness and uh, 25 in the Lumosity group. So there are significantly more people who gave up their seat to the person on crutches if they'd gone through the online mindfulness training and significantly fewer if they'd gone through just the bare attentional competence training. And so there may be something about being able to regulate our own emotions that gives us an empathic bridge, perhaps, to people who are presenting with similar levels of emotions. And so, in closing, let me say that we've started talking about depression and clinical disorders. We talked about treatments and interventions. 
and introduced the concept of mindfulness as an important way of um, serving as a proxy, perhaps, for some of the um, more concretized interventions. But ultimately what you find is that as people practice mindfulness and as they begin to embrace its potential, it becomes less of a artifact in their lives. It becomes much more of a way of life that isn't practiced in a sort of precious setting as something they need to do for themselves for the day, but it becomes something that they can infuse throughout their day. It becomes more a way of life, less a treatment, and they become more uh, and more integrated f with it, and it becomes less and less separate from them. In that way, there are a couple of important goals that get met. The first is that the integration into their lives enhances their ability for self-care. It also allows them to pull together parts of themselves that may have felt as if they were separated, the part of them that was depressed and sad, the part of them that was intact, and ultimately move and reach for a greater sense of wholeness from one day to the next. Thank you very much.